the world. Okay, cool, great. Great, okay. Um, so actually, I guess we will do an introduction, Bessie. <laughs> so <laughs> would you go ahead and introduce great. yourself? Not a problem, however you wanna take it. And um, Bessie Kapulian, so very nice to uh, see a lot of familiar faces. I'm really happy that you um, guys are here and, and certainly appreciate the invitation that uh, Dave and, and Brandon and Reggie extended to me um, to join today. Look forward to pouring into you and, and sharing my knowledge. Uh, but very briefly, Vesi Kapulian, I'm based in Los Angeles, California, fellow warrior, um, former commercial lender, now full-time real estate investor. Uh, as many started my journey as an investor in the residential space and eventually transitioned to uh, the multifamily space. And as of last year, um, have started doing that full-time. Um, my uh, superpowers are underwriting, which is probably why <laughs> I was kindly invited to join today's meeting. Uh, but in all seriousness, I really do enjoy it. And um, granted, I was doing that uh, for for my job uh, before I transitioned into real estate full time. Um, so for 15 years, and I was briefly sharing uh, with Dave and Mike um, right before we um opened the meeting and hit the recording. Uh, most of my career underwriting was in the CNI commercial and industrial space, underwriting middle market multinational companies. I um, did uh, have an opportunity to, I basically was promoted and that um, effectively transitioned me to the um, domestic division of the bank that I used to work for. And that gave me tremendous exposure um, on the in the real estate space because a big chunk of our book was commercial real estate specifically multifamily um, but we did have also some industrial some owner occupied real estate some uh, specialized assets like data centers hotels schools churches etc gas stations <laughs> so a pretty pretty wide variety um and uh, it was definitely a transition um, for me because as a lender, you always look at the downside and the risks and what could go wrong and how you can mitigate it. As an investor, you um, usually tend to look at the upside and what's the opportunity. So um, there were definitely um, things that I needed to adjust to be more balanced. But um, And we can talk about some of those today, but um, that's just very um, briefly about myself, my background and 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 of uh, why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so what we typically do is maybe start the first 10 minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, with some news. And Vessie's post this week about banking really interests me. So maybe, Vessie, you can uh, expand on that just a touch. Yes. So uh, I, I geek out on data as well, if you haven't noticed. So that was a pretty extensive report. But for those of you who really want to focus on the cliff notes, probably the first couple of pages um, is where I would, what I would say the summary is. And that particular report focused on one lender, Arbor, um, but I found it interesting because I think it's probably descriptive of a lot of the distress that um, many lenders uh, have been going through or will be going through while some of the government programs that are in place uh, right now run out at the end of March, um, coupled with a few other um, regulatory changes that are coming into the banking environment um, that will ultimately cause them to be more conscientious on how they spend and how they deploy their capital. Um, but specifically for that article um, or I guess analysis that I shared, um, it really focused on Arbor, which was one of the more prominent lenders in the uh, space over the past couple of years, or at least one that grabbed a pretty sizable market share um, when a lot of deals that were getting done were basically done um, based on bridge debt. And um, uh, what I found interesting about it, there are always two sides of the story, right? So you always um, hear a lot about what the operators could have done right, but there's always another side of the equation, and that's the lender. And I saw a lot of that in 07, 09, when um, 
the deals that we're getting in the market were crazy. And a lot of that kind of repeated itself in all in 21, 20, early 2022. Um, and it's not surprising because lenders have their financial goals too. And, and some tend to get more aggressive, especially when things are um, going great. And I think that's probably what happened here because um, some of these deals, um, and, and I'm looking at some of them right now that I passed on a couple of years ago, they're now coming back on the market, um, marketed by brokers. And, and clearly some are in distress, some, um, or I should say some are in more distress than others. Um, but definitely one of the takeaways there is um, there was a lot of excitement, enthusiasm, greed, whatever you want to call it, um, in the market. And that inevitably impacted how decisions were made on both sides of the equation, whether you're an investor slash buyer, um, but also a lender and, and how you underwrite um, those properties. So adhering to fundamentals is something I firmly believe in. Um, and in my case, that basically has resulted in more uh, slower growth, I, I suppose, but yeah. but I'm okay with that, especially um, when we hit turbulent waters like we have hit today. And so the article really did a deep dive into, um, first of all, how those deals were originated. And the moral of the story there was they were, first of all, very highly leveraged. And, and yes, high leverage results in better um improves the returns, but it also means higher risk. Uh, so just because you see 22% or 30% IRR doesn't necessarily mean that's a better deal. It just means that probably there is more risk involved. So you need to decide if that's something you're comfortable with. And the answer is there's no right or wrong answer. It, it depends on one's personal um, tolerance, uh, risk tolerance, as well as investment criteria and objectives. Uh, but then the second, I guess, moral of the story was, okay, so aggressively, probably aggressively underwritten high leverage deals. In many cases, um, the operations had fallen behind. Uh, and, and there were several examples with names you would probably recognize uh, from social media uh, in terms of how um, those uh, people had lost uh, track of operations. I think a lot of the people who were cited were some were more the capital raisers and others were truly the operators. Like I think Apple's way was um, an operator supposedly, but again, even then they had lost track of um, just the important grasp of, on managing those day-to-day -day operations. And naturally that led to a decline in NOI. So in some cases you're hit with on both ends. One is the aggressive underwriting with high leverage and floating rate debt. Then you get hit with a decline in NOI. And naturally, when you're looking at the property values today, they're all underwater, um, not even worth the loan on the books. So um, ultimately the conclusion of the article was, I think it was one of the their investors um, who was doing the analysis basically um, saying don't buy don't buy the arbor stock because um, they're they're going to be hitting pretty rough waters. But again, I don't think it's just arbor. I think there are a lot of uh, banks that are um, going through or, or will be going through that, especially this, the mid tier ones, the regional um, ones where um, they have a sizable a sizable share of their book is centered around commercial um, real estate. So. I'll, I'll pause for a moment because uh, I can talk on and on and on. <laughs> Feel free to interrupt me, by the way, and uh, see if there are any questions regarding the article or any of my observations. Any questions, anyone? No? no all I would say is your observations are spot on. And yeah, I think uh, Arbor is definitely in a spotlight, but I think there's a few other ones that are Still trying to figure out how to um, deal with that all right now, but um, the rubber is going to meet the road. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not pleasant to see or read or, or hear about, but it's kind of, um, I heard the analogy once about uh, Mother Nature and how we all inhale and exhale. And I think it's time for us to exhale, reset. And, and start strong. Um, again, it's not going to be pretty for everyone. So I, I certainly don't like to see or read about the pain and 
um, some of the losses that people will experience, but I think the reset is necessary and will hopefully lead to more reasonable valuations. I don't know if we'll ever get back to the day where, when we buy properties based on actuals. I think it, it tends to happen more now in today's environment than um, a year or two ago. Um, but uh, hopefully the experience we're going through now will be at least educational um, for many. Um, so uh, with the next go around, people can um, maybe make less passionate or enthusiastic choices. That's a great way to put it. And what's the number one rule, I think, is uh, don't buy with emotion. It's or yeah, very difficult when you fall in love with the asset. Um, I always like to say fall in love with the numbers, no, not with the asset. But as one of my mentors also said, uh, numbers don't lie, but I can make them say anything I want. Um, so that's another thing to be very careful about. And I can I can talk more about it as I dive into some of my, the um, top um, tips and strategies, at least those that were helpful for me as I transitioned into underwriting. But um Certainly, there's a lot of truth to that, Dave. That's a fantastic segue. So uh, why don't you go ahead and get started with uh, what you want to teach us today? All right. Um, well, as uh, Dave and I were chatting um, ahead of the call and uh, thinking through what topics would add the most value to you guys, I think we ultimately settled on um, some of the top uh, tips and strategies that help, at least help me um, as I started um, or transitioning into the underwriting space. Um, a lot of those are also frequently asked questions um, that I often encounter as I uh, speak with current perspective, um, newer investors, passive investors as well. Um, so we'll share those with you. I have about 10 and we'll, we'll go through those. By all means, feel free. Um, if questions pop up, um, feel free to chime in. I'd like this to be interactive. But um, I'll start with the, the first one I would say is focus or the power of focus. Um, specifically, as you start underwriting property, it's extremely important for you to know the market that you operate in. Down the road, you can definitely diversify. But as you in the very beginning, while you're trying to get comfortable with so many variables and challenges coming your way, um, having at least one of those variables being constant, namely the market, is key. Um, and over time, that will help you in so many ways, um, not only knowing your numbers in terms of vacancies, rents, cap rates, having the resources, the contacts. Um, it will really make you a true, true expert, on, not only on the market, but also on the data and will help you be more efficient. Um, where I see a lot of people struggle in the beginning is when they jump from one city or state to the next. And um, for me, at least, that was very overwhelming. I Some people can handle it and, and, and more power to them. Uh, but in my case, I decided to focus on one state and specifically within that state, two to three cities. Um, so for me, that was Florida. And I focused on Tampa and Orlando and, and Jacksonville um, as potential. And um, it was incredible because not only you learn the uh, metrics for that market, uh, one of the wild variables and one of the um, items that has pretty big impact on the numbers usually is taxes. And those vary from county to county. So again, being an expert on the market really helps you learn those nuances. Um, so number one, focus on the market. Number two, I would say is select one underwriting model and being consistent. There are a ton out there. None of them is perfect. Um, sometimes if you really want to create the perfect model for you, you may even build your own. Personally, I didn't um, choose to invest the time and energy in building one, given that there were a number of options out there. Um, so I would say pick one model and stick to it. Again, down the road, that is not to say that you cannot switch models or jump between models. And especially as you start working with various operators, uh, whether you're joining the GP team in one capacity or another, or as a capital raiser, 
um, down the road, yes, you'll need to be very nimble and, and need to learn how different underwriting models work. But in the beginning, start with one and really dive into it. Um, try to understand how the different variables and key performance indicators are calculated, uh, because those are things that you can carry away with you even as you transition to other ones. Um, also, not all of them will have, um, if you take the same deal and underwrite it with two or three different models, none of them will have the same output. Uh, and again, a lot of them are structured differently, but once you get into, once you understand the formulas and those KPIs, then you'll be able to quickly um, transition from one model to another and figure out what is the difference and why are they not exact, why are the outputs not exactly the same. Uh, and again, a lot of it boils down to how they're structured. Um, but again, so number two, start with one underwriting model and stick to it uh, and be the best at it. And down the road, you can diversify. Um, and number three is understand how these model works. Um, you don't want to be just a data entry person or, um, yes, it's important to know how to plug in the numbers to know where they go and why, um, but also understand what they mean and how one um, metric impacts the other. So try to go beyond just the data entry or the mechanics, but really understand the why um, behind it and, and the impact. Um, as you're digging into and getting familiar with the, the process and the market is develop a relationship with what I call trust, but verify third parties. Um, so those would be your property manager, insurance broker, um, lender, contractor. Um, yes, over time you will develop your own expertise, but you definitely want to um, have that validated by third parties and, and hopefully more by more than one. Um, and I have some uh, war stories to share if we, if we have enough time as to why it's important to have more than just one party um, validate those numbers. Don't just take the word of one lender or one property manager or, or one contractor, especially in the beginning. Once you've done a few of these deals and closed on a couple of properties, and especially again, if you focus on the market, pretty soon you'll have a good idea of where the numbers land and you don't have to call uh, all these three, four different people every time. Um, but in the beginning, it's important to have those two or three, call it sources of uh, trust, but verify third party sources. Um, really understand the risks, and there are a lot of risks um, involved as we approach investment opportunities. You have market and economics risk, mm -hmm. submarket risk, um, financing risk, operational risk, liquidity risk, refinance risk, legal risk, interest rate risk, um, and all of these inevitably impact or have the potential to impact your numbers. Um, so um, really understanding the effect they have um, on the valuations and on the cash flow is key. Um, that's why I also like to look at sensitivity analysis. Um, so as you're looking for different models, um, having one or, or building your own sensitivity table is key. Um, so you can really understand, okay, yes, as an investor, you want to know what the potential is and what the upside is, but also understand the downside. Um, and that's especially uh, prominent in the current environment where, uh, for better or worse, um, we are experiencing, right, the down market. Um, you cannot eliminate risk, as I like to tell people. The only way to avoid risk is not to take one, uh, but then I don't even know if that's the best outcome. So you cannot eliminate risk, uh, but just understand what the risks are and how those can be mitigated. And that goes back to the earlier point I make. I made around not only just plugging in numbers in the model, but understanding those numbers and their meaning. And once you do that, um, as you start thinking through the various risks and their potential impact, um, then you can um, work through that in, in your um, underwriting and modeling. Uh, be mindful of the debt and how it is structured. I was asked uh, recently on an interview if I've ever done variable rate loans and um, I uh, I haven't. All the all the loans I've always done have been fixed rate debt, and I think some of that comes from my lender background. Because again, interest rate risk is one of those risks that I just outlined, 
And personally, I don't know where rates would be. Maybe, maybe I have an idea in the next six to 12 months, but the deals we're entering into for the most part are three, five, seven year deals. Nobody knows where rates would be. Nobody could have predicted, right? That the Fed will raise rates, what was it? 12 times in 18 months. Um, nobody could have foreseen that. Um, so um, first of all, hedging the interest rate exposure is one. Uh, not getting over leveraged uh, would be another. Um, and really being mindful of um, how your debt structure matches your business plan. So in some cases, you may not be able to obtain permanent financing. And especially right now, we're entering into a period where there are a lot of and will be a lot of distressed deals. So uh, probably not something Fannie or Freddie would walk into because they have their own underwriting um, requirements. But if you're getting, um, say, bridge debt, then think through, um, again, the rate. Uh, there is a fixed rate option for bridge debt, and that wasn't very popular a couple of years ago, but I think more people are talking about it now. And think through your exit strategy on the debt and your refinance risk and understand that even in those cases, um, often these loans are marketed as five-year deals, but they're really not five-year deals. It's a three-year deal with two one-year extension options, and those extension options are not guaranteed. The lender has the right to walk away, and there's nothing in their credit agreement that says that they'll give you an extension. Um, so, so again, thinking through, through those risks and the financing, and is it right for the business plan as well? Um, cap rates is another... Um, huge, huge, huge lever um, that impacts valuations. I would say probably getting the right rent comps and getting the right cap rates. Um, those are the two variables that have the largest impact on your valuation. Um, and that's where you, you may get emotional, especially if you like a deal and you start thinking through your exit cap rate and you, you think, well, maybe it will be flat five years from now, or maybe it will decline. And again, I'm not saying that there is a right or wrong answer here, because a lot of that depends on your risk tolerance, your outlook on the markets. But personally, when I see deals with that assumed declining uh, rate caps or using the co-star projections and things like that, I, I just I personally get a little weary. Again, that's just me. It doesn't mean that's the way to do it. Um, and, and, and that's also a number that will change with the markets. If you had asked me um, a year ago how I model my cap rates, I would tell you I'm adding 20 basis points every year. Um, why? Because we were in a really low rate environment and the Fed at that time was starting to raise rent, uh, rates. And sure enough, they continued on that journey for um, a little over a year. In today's market, if you ask me how do I model my cap rates, I would say, yeah, probably reverting back to the 10 basis points a year because I believe we're at the peak of the Fed hikes. And in fact, right, the Fed uh, intimated a week or two ago that and they're now looking to reduce rates. So them 20 bips a year may be overly conservative and probably kill too many, maybe even good deals. Um, but all that to say is be mindful of your entry cap rates and your exit cap rates because those have a multiplier effect on the valuation. Um, reserves is another hidden <laughs> mind that I see. A lot of people get very, um, I guess, optimistic on the reserve side of the equation. And inevitably, that's your cushion uh, when... Um, you experience periods of compressed cash flows. I, I, I've seen it happen. And um, because of that, I tend to lead on the more conservative side. I'd, I'd like to see at least six months of operating expenses and debt service, or maybe one year of operating expenses, which ends up being roughly the same. Uh, but I know a lot of models, uh, you know, have their rules of thumb and, um, you know, $1,000 a door and this and that. Um, just because the model has a rule of thumb doesn't mean it's right or wrong. So take a step back, reassess and adjust it according to your own risk tolerance. Um, and then that leads me to the next point, which is beware of aggressive assumptions. Uh, and again, that can be very difficult, especially if you fall in love with the deal and really want to figure out how to get it done. But I'm thinking through the rent growth, the economic and physical vacancy, 
um, the expense ratios, evaluating even the expenses on a per dollar basis, all of that is key. And that goes back to one of the original points I made around knowing your market, um, as well as having your trust but verify um, third party sources to help you validate um, some of those assumptions. And um, last but not uh, least, uh, repetition is power. Um, underwriting as many deals as you can really uh, build those, builds that muscle power, those reps, that knowledge to a point where the process will become second nature to you. I know it's tedious. I know it's frustrating, especially in the beginning. Um, may take you a couple hours to underwrite a deal, but if you keep at it, soon those couple of hours will turn into an hour and maybe half an hour. Uh, eventually to do at least that preliminary underwrite. Um, and, and if you're focused on a particular market, uh, then maybe just a couple minutes once you get the uh, email from the broker because you have your criteria pretty well dialed in. Uh, and you've by that point, you will have underwritten so many deals that you already just by seeing it on paper, you'll know if that will work or not. So I know I... Um, threw a lot at you, so I'm going to pause and see um, if there are questions, but um, those are things that I went through as I made the transition right from the lender side of the equation to the operator, and um, those were things that were helpful in my journey, so I thought I would share them uh, with you and hopefully add value. Wow, there's a lot there. Thank you. <laughs> um, Daniel, you have a question? Unmute. Oh, oh yeah, I had um, asked how Bessie was going to, or I guess how she played with her sensitivity model, but she answered as she was going through on, um, she was addressing the elder caps and the rent rates as those would be the biggest drivers. Did you get that, Bessie? Uh, yes, but it sounds like I answered it, so I'm not quite sure if there's something I'll need yeah, to. Yeah, no, nothing from my end. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make sure like I wasn't missing some things. Those were pretty much the main pieces that I try to look at when I'm um, underwriting as well. So <clears throat> thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Bessie, can you talk a little bit more about risk management? That's one thing I don't see in webinars. I don't see them on OMs. I don't see them. Well, you're not going to see on the OM. Um, I don't see them in investor calls or hear about them in investor calls. Nobody talks about the what the potential downside can be, and you label quite a few of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just tell us how you express this to your investors? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I, I mentioned quite a few, probably around uh, nine or ten different risks when it comes to markets, submarkets. So as I as I evaluate the deal, um, I, I think through what is the impact of some of those events. For example, um, in, in relation to the current market environment, in relation to the particular sub-market um, that I'm evaluating, are the rents that are being presented to me realistic? And if, if I can't find outside data supporting that, uh, and I'll, I, I saw Mary Jane's question pop up in a second, so I'll come to it in a moment. Um, then that's a good question to ask the operator. Well, tell me why you feel good about these rate assumptions and 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 what are what are the comps that you're using um, to kind of support um, that growth. Um, and I can't tell you how many deals have come to my table. Um, some are beautifully underwritten um, or or situations where the person spent hours underwriting the deal they didn't think about the market risk or the sub market and um that's usually the first thing i look at and because personally i'd like to stay away from class d areas or or low median household income areas basically war zones um and i can tell you how many times people and that's i think probably our human nature to dive straight into the work and get into the numbers uh, but we tend to overlook all the surrounding um, factors that can impact those numbers. And one of those uh, surrounding or ancillary factors or exogenous factors, right, is the markets. Because you can do a lot of things to a property to improve its appeal, but you cannot lift it and shift it to a different location, um, especially if it happens to be in one of those more challenging areas. Um, 
and if it happens to be in those one of those challenging areas then i definitely question how do you why do you think you're going to get all of a sudden from 900 dollars a door to 1500 a door and does the median household income really support that unless you have two or three couples right living in an apartment i suppose then you can achieve that but is that realistic um so so that that's one aspect of it the market risk definitely the interest rate risk um, and i talked about that depending on what financing option um, you have not not everyone may have the fixed the traditional fixed rate debt um, the way we look at it um, but certain providers may offer other um, other options to to mitigate that and i uh, included a copy of the uh, of an article that i wrote about different interest rate risk mitigation strategies and i know we briefly talked about it at the last underwriting call um, but hopefully um, that will explain how those different derivatives work uh, and different ways to mitigate the interest rate risk exposure of course financing risk um, and i posted about that earlier this week i think on, on um, linkedin uh, with respect to some of the regulatory changes coming up on the market, I think the Arbor article is probably another case in point that we discussed earlier. Uh, but really, working with a lender that you know will follow through uh, and not leave you hanging at, at the altar. That happened to me before, and I just assumed, oh, lenders work like I did <laughs> when I was a commercial lender, but um, that was not the case. Um, so definitely, against the um, one of the comments I made earlier, make sure you have at least a couple of options. Loan brokers don't like that. They hate it. They don't like to be shopped. I get it. Uh, but what's worse? <laughs> um, not being able to close on a property, that's a good investment. And then um, uh, falling through and not delivering for your partners and your investors. Um, and then again, as I when I mentioned financing risk, I'm also referring to uh, think through is that type of financing right for the business plan um, that you have um, liquidity really boils down to the reserves um, and not only the liquidity that typically you raise for up front but also collectively on the gp team what does your liquidity look like again a lot of deals are going through distress right now and in some cases gps are stepping in to kind of float the deal in the short run um, lenders will also look at that when they um, evaluate how to handle distress situations. So if, if there is a good amount of outside net worth and liquidity available among the sponsor team, um, that definitely adds more comfort. Uh, but in addition to that, having sufficient operating and then capex reserves, um, that's your rainy day fund, as I'd like to call it. Um, and uh, what else? Legal risk that really boils down to the documents and understanding the agreements you're signing. I can't tell you how many people don't read their credit agreement. And I recognize it's not bedtime reading. I get it. <laughs> neither neither is the PPM and the operating agreement, but it's important to understand those and how they're structured. Um, I have passed on deals before um, that I thought were not structured in line with my criteria and those of my investors um, but I had to take the time and read through those and again it's not fun um, but just like with anything the more you do it the more comfortable um, you will get um, you will become with it um, so I'll pause there and hopefully that expanded a little bit more around the, the risk management and how to think through that but I'm happy to dive um, deeper uh, if needed that was great. Thank you. And I promised to come back to Mary Jane's question as we started talking about markets. And um, I saw the question pop up. What is your favorite place to find rents, um, especially as you're entering a market? And I'll start there. Uh, brand new to a market. Um, I like to start with public sources. I, uh, your Ideally, if you have access to Colstar or Yardi, that will be great. Um, but those are typically uh, paid resources and um, subscription based. So as a new investor, you may or may not have access to those. So some of those public sources are um, apartments.com. Uh, periodically, I do check out Rentometer. Um, uh, those would be probably two. Uh, apartment list is another one. 
um, that has rent information. Um, the one caveat I will say there is that a lot of these public sources show you the uh, listed rent or, or the advertised rent. They don't show you the effective rent or what these units are actually charging, which may be lower. So that's something to keep in mind, um, which is why at least in the beginning of my journey, I built a relationship with a couple of property managers. And so when you see an asset that you think you like, or maybe you'll submit an LOI, I would also run my estimates by them. Um, also down the road is you start, um, if you think you're gonna submit an LOI or close to getting an LOI, you can also ask the broker for what's known as the CoStar underwriting report. And that will have a ton of information. Um, the caveat there is you don't want to be calling your property manager or your broker every week for a report or a comp and, and then not closing on deals. So maybe at least have a couple of resources, maybe a couple of PMs you can tap into. Um, and then with your brokers, obviously be mindful on how frequently you ask for that particular report because um, eventually they're going to want you to close and move through and not just send your report after report. Um, but those would be a few resources that I um, I would look into for the preliminary underwrite. Hopefully that was helpful, Mary, but uh, if not, I can expand on any of those further. It was. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, Vesta, this is Reggie. How are you doing? Hi, Reggie. Great to see you. You too, you too. Uh, I had a question about, I know you've been underwriting for quite a, a long time now, but when you first started, did you typically do the quick underwriting just to see if you needed to continue further and do the full underwriting? Or did you just go ahead and do the full underwriting just to continue to get your reps in? Great question. I, I did the full underwriting in the beginning to get my reps in, um, build the processes further, um, customized the spreadsheet that I was using or still using to analyze properties um, and, and tweak it further. And eventually that helped me become more efficient, have my process down um, so I can improve down the road. But in the beginning, yes, anything and everything I got a hold of, I would underwrite it. <laughs> Thanks. And it makes a difference because think about it, if you underwrite one deal a week versus one a day, uh, by the end of the year, right, you would have underwritten 365 deals and I would have done 52. So who do you think will have more experience and, and more intimate knowledge of the market? You will, right? Um, so there is something to be said about the reps. And again, I know it's tedious work in the beginning. Um, I, I know it takes a lot of time, but Trust me, the more you do it, uh, the more second nature it will feel over time. So Vessi, you mentioned hedging your debt. Can you explain a little more about how you do that? Uh, yes, the interest rate risk. Um, Just in general. Just make sure to, to hedge your debt. Maybe, you know, you have this much debt here. How would you offset that if something, let's, you know, the interest rate, let's just take that. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, yeah, usually when I um, think about hedging the, the loans or the debt, I, I would, I do think through the interest rate risk, uh, probably the other uh, item that comes to mind overall, as I think about debt is the leverage component. Um, again, I don't like to go too high in leverage, 75% gets me a little jittery, but I, I think I can live with that if it's a really strong deal. Um, so where we are at in the current environment feels very comfortable. And there is a reason why lenders are there. We can also talk about that. Um, but yeah, for in interest rate risk, really how you um, mitigate that risk is by fixing the rate um, or managing how much your rate can fluctuate. Uh, fluctuate. Um, in most cases, when you go with the traditional um, agencies um, or sometimes the larger financial institutions, uh, they will be able to give you that um, fixed rate. 
um, either directly or fix it in the form of a swap. That's one of the derivatives or financial contracts used to fix your index rate. So if so for today is at 530 and you're getting into a five-year loan, maybe they fix it at 550. Um, so then you know for the duration of your deal, your index rate would be 550 plus whatever spread the lender is giving you uh, will be your all-in rate. So that's one less variable on the expense side of the equation um, that you have to worry about. And you also mentioned that if you're going to turn a property in five years, um, the three year of the loan is guaranteed and the other two are what? Um, yes, yeah, so I was referring to the um, bridge loans because a lot of times people say, oh, they're, it's a five year deal. Um, but when you really read through the contract or the terms, it's three year term. That's what the bank or the lender is committing to. Plus two one-year extension options um, but those extensions are not guaranteed of course there, there are fees involved with that and that you'll need to account for if if you're thinking that you may want to extend that um, so the lender is in no way obligated to provide those extension options this is the first i'm hearing of that but great information you know by yourself that's the first time i've heard it explained that way too yeah yeah, so make sure you understand as, as you're getting uh, presented with term sheets. And, and again, term sheets are not commitments to lend. I, I, see, I hear a lot of people get frustrated. Well, the lender promised me this. Uh, 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 uh. No, no, no. <laughs> term sheet is valid for today. <laughs> it can change tomorrow. <laughs> so especially as the lender um, gets into the diligence process or if we have exogenous events like um, rates change, right? by the time you close your your rate may be different and, and typically they won't lock the rate until closing day or or a week or so before you close um so that is all subject to change uh, and really understanding that up, up front is is also key um but those extension option unless it's explicitly stated in the loan documents uh that they're committing to do it and under what conditions um, sometimes they may put conditions that are pretty open-ended, so it's kind of feels secure, but it's not really secure. <laughs> um, but these are important nuances to to think about. Um, and again, the lender is not in the business of foreclosing on properties. So if you're a borrower in good standing, the property is performing well, um, maybe there was a delay Um with executing on your project, you need that extra year, like COVID would be a good example of that. You know, they they, they should be willing to, to work with you, uh, but they don't have to work with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Vinci, this is Juan. Can you I, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great to see you. <laughs> Hey, likewise. Uh, I was trying to send a a, uh, a question via the chat, and and I'm I'm a, apparently I don't know how to do it, so I, I sent it to uh, to Mary Lou. Um, so my <laughs> question was, can you talk a little bit more about your philosophy on on modeling cap rates? I'm total newbie here, uh, never invested multifamily. Uh, is is cap rates capitalization rates? Is that what it means? Yes. And it, does that have to do with appreciation? Um, it, it impacts the valuation of the property for sure. Um, but for, for those of you who are um, just now becoming familiar with the concept of a cap rate, um, think of it as the unlevered return um, that you will generate on the property. That's probably the, the simplest way I can explain it. So, so is you're building equity, so your equity buildup? Um, it's your return on investment, effectively. Um, you can think of it that way. And I'm oversimplifying it. Um, but why it impacts your valuation, Juan, is because unlike the single family space where most properties are valued based on um, comps, sales comps, um, in the commercial world, a property is valued based on um, its profit or the operating profit that it generates. Um, mm -hmm. So the valuation there is derived by um, taking the net operating income or your operating profit 
and dividing it by the cap rate, um, which is why earlier I was saying it has a multiplier effect on the valuation in terms of how you set it, not only of the, at the beginning when you take over an asset, um, but also what you're projecting in the end. And a lot of people use cap rates because how you choose to buy a property and finance it may be different from how I choose to finance a property. So the cap rate takes that, that financing um, part of the equation out and purely looks at on a like for like basis, if I was to compare these two properties um, based on the NOI that each of them um, generate respectively, um, keeping all else equal, meaning the cap rate, what would the value be? So it takes it makes an attempt to kind of equalize two properties. Um, in so so it, it, and and I I am still a little, you know, uh, in the weeds here. Can uh -huh. can you maybe just give a very simple example? Like if you if you're if you're bringing a hundred thousand dollars in cash, and then you you would take the profits divided by the hundred thousand dollars in cash, or how how does what's the what would be the cap rate? Um, yeah, so uh, so the cap rate is really tied to the purchase price, not necessarily to the cash investment that you uh, make to the property. But let's just say in this case, you're buying a hundred thousand property, a property that is valued a hundred thousand, and let's just say you're buying it all cash. So that's all you're spending your um, hundred thousand dollars, and uh, sorry, um, your hundred dollars on. And let's just say that particular property generates. Um, ten dollars a year. Um, so in that case, that property is valued at a ten percent cap rate. Um, because you, um, when you take the NOI, and uh, I'm mixing it up now. Um, NOI divided by the purchase price, ten over a hundred gives you ten percent. Okay, and so when you model, you said that you used to add twenty basis points, and now you add ten. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. Um, so usually when we um, look at a multifamily property, uh, first of all, you want to uh, understand what is the entry cap rate. And usually that's the um, cap rate um, that you're purchasing that property at. And for the most part, that should equal the market rate, but it, that's not always the case. Um, so let's just say you're buying a property today and I'm going to use your example because it has nice round numbers. Let's just say you're buying it at 10% cap rate. Um, again, not, not market, but I'm using it for illustrative purposes. Um, usually in the commercial space, we'd like to increase that cap rate. Um, what does that mean? When you're increasing the cap rate, effectively you're saying all else equal. So if my net operating income or profit doesn't change, uh, my property is actually going to decline in value and is ex exactly what you're doing by increasing the cap rate at the time of sale. And you may wonder, well, why, why on earth do I want to do that? Well, to be more conservative, because you don't know where the market will be five years from now. If the market declines, meaning if cap rates increase, um, then um, you've planned for it, you've accounted for it, you've modeled it in your numbers. Uh, but if the market improves, of course, then you're going to do better. And then your original projections where you thought the price would go down in value because of the increasing cap rate, all else equal, um, then you've done better. But at least you've accounted for those market fluctuations. And, and we're mm -hmm. seeing that right now uh, play itself because cap rates a few years ago were 3 to 4%, depending on market. Um, now they're creeping up at five, six, or 7% anywhere, um, depending on the market. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. So when you're underwriting, Vessi, and mm -hmm. you're talking about exit cap, you want that to be higher than the entry cap? Yes, usually I do, um, exactly because it assumes the market will get worse. In other words, yeah, cap rates will increase, and if cap rates increase, my property value goes down. Actually, the first time I'm hearing that too, because anytime I speak with people about underwriting, they always want the cap rate at the end to be lower so that they've actually increased the value. Oh, so, um, 
as a, as a seller, yes, as a seller, you always, you want it to be lower. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But when I'm underwriting, I'm assuming it to be higher. Um, don't get me wrong. I don't want the markets to get worse, <laughs> um, but I have to model for that and I have to plan for it. Um, and, and if I see in a financial model, and I have seen that when people estimate that um, for cap rates to decline five years from now, um, or that makes me nervous because I don't know where the markets are, and but maybe the other people know, so they feel very confident about that. Wow, thank you. And that's one of the ways that people um, fudge their numbers to mm-hmm. get the profits they want. So it's something you got to be careful about. Yeah, it has a huge multiplier effect. The rents, the rents and cap rates can make your valuation look insanely great. And I, I think in the at least in the MFA tool, it's it's baked in as the the default value is for your cap rate to increase. I want to say fifteen bips. I think is what the default is in the MFA tool. So uh, it, it's if for anybody using that, it's it's baked in there. You can adjust it, so you can definitely change it to whatever you want. But it's baked in, just like just like Fessy's saying, where it, it does increase each each year. Mm-hmm. Uh, See. So uh, if you're using that tool, uh, you've been doing that unless you've changed it. Yeah. No, it's good to know. Thanks, Brandon. And Vessi, I sorry. Hi, I'm Joseph for work, guys. Um, I joined like two, three minutes late, and you guys were talking a bit about the uh, risks of the. I think you were talking about the upcoming risk and the potential and what's happening. Correct me if I'm wrong. But. In was it was I right? You guys were talking about this. Uh, we were talking about the banking industry in one of the okay. recent yeah. articles I published in the. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah. So the overall kind of like how you know the risk and taking making sure you're not taking risk enough, uh, you're not taking risk a lot, etc. Mm-hmm. But I ask here, and it's not only for you, for everyone. I ask, you know, mm-hmm. what are you guys doing and preparing for both scenarios? regardless like yes there is a lot of properties in distress mm-hmm. yes you might find you might find but what if you find a good deal today would you would you hop on it or would you also factor in it the potential of next year kind of oh this year sorry sorry this year this year a massive um i don't know economic downtrend or whatever yeah, I mean, I would definitely factor in all the risks, right? And and that also goes to the sensitivity analysis and, and why I like to do it because it explores the different gradients. If rents were to increase by X, what happens to your valuation or your IRR and projected returns? If cap rates were to increase um, by a certain gradient, what's the impact of that? Um, so I'll definitely account for it. And... Ultimately, even with distress opportunities, how I would personally approach them is really adhere to the underwriting fundamentals um, and, and try not to steer away from those too much. You definitely want to understand, yes, what the opportunity is, because investors, that's why we also do the deals. Um, but you also want to understand what the risks are and, and mitigate that downside. And in the current environment, a lot of that boils down to having to raise that additional equity, whether it's for reserves, some of the escrows that lenders are now requiring um, for a variety of reasons. And we can also talk about that. And then LTVs are now lower. And a lot of people get angry with lenders. Like, yeah, they're not lending 75% anymore. Well, they are. <laughs> Their term sheet probably says 75%, but it's the lesser of 75% or it's some debt yield requirement or the appraised value or a million dollar number 125 debt service cover and and that service um, your noi or your cash flow is now compressed because you're dealing with softer rents higher expenses and higher cost of debt um, so inevitably then how do you control um, that part of the equation is in order to meet that minimum debt service requirement, 
well, now you give less debt, there is less debt to service and that's how they're managing. Um, hence why the LTVs are lower. But if you find a property that cash flows a ton, they'll probably lend you 75% if you hit all of their um, checklists as far as experience and track record, et cetera. Do you have any strategies to not be overly conservative and not blow up every deal that you come across? Because I feel like I'm good at doing that. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something I'm struggling with every day. <laughs> I, I tend to think of myself as more conservative. And again, probably um, comes from my lender background. Um, so it's a battle I'm constantly fighting. And um, probably one is having those second set of eyes and maybe other people to discuss the deal with. Um, people who may have a different perspective, that's one. Um, but I will say um, underwriting a ton of deals and having experience in the market also helps because over time, in the beginning, you may be um, adhering more closely um, to some of those, um, I hate the rule, the, the word rules of thumb, but I'll just say the rules of thumb. So in the beginning, you may be adhering more closely to them. Uh, but over time, as you get to know the market and rents in certain certain area, or roughly speaking, how much a rehab would cost uh, for a certain type of remodel, say of a two bed, one bed, um, that's where you may start uh, maybe getting a little bit more lenient with the numbers. Um, but I would really always recommend start off with, with the baseline and, and really understand where some of those areas of cushion are which may be in your reserves, maybe in some of your uh, rent assumptions, maybe in some of your expense assumptions. And if you need to dial them in a little bit closer as you start going into the second, third, fourth version of, of that underwrite, then you can do that there. Um, but I wouldn't compromise um, from the beginning. And I feel that's very, that's probably the hardest, hardest part to do once you fall in love with the deal. For sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We're getting close to our time here. Just want to be mindful of Bessie's time. And even groups like that one, when I joined the warrior group, there wasn't, well, there was one underwriting group, but I think it was sunsetting at the time when I was joining. So even um, bringing your question to a group like this, hey guys, this is how I'm thinking through it any other perspectives to add. Uh, so that may be other ways to uh, maybe offer different perspective and help you get, I guess, unstuck from that um, more conservative place. But I I think that's a good place or good base to be starting off of. Excellent. Well, thank you, Vessi. Really appreciate your time. And you don't know that I was gonna do this and I haven't mentioned it to her at all, but she has an underwriting program that she's doing. You want to maybe talk about that for a second? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yes, I, um, I over the course of the last couple of years, I've spoken to a lot of um, different investors and didn't really um, have the time to put that into action. But um, finally, now that I'm now that I've transitioned full time into real estate, um, had a chance to systematize and organize, um, really provide a streamlined blueprint um, to help others who are looking to learn how to underwrite uh, specifically multifamily properties. Um, and that evolved into a 10 week course that I lead over Zoom. We meet once a week for about 90 minutes or so. Um, and I help people do exactly that, learn how to underwrite multifamily properties from A to Z without feeling overwhelmed, confused, and being able to quickly um, navigate through the complexities of the underwriting and uh, really spot um, some of the areas of concern when a deal is presented to them. So you want to maybe drop a link in the chat so people can check it out? Yeah, happy to do that. I will pull it right now. And if anyone is interested, they can also reach out to me directly if you guys have any questions. Um, I actually i am finishing up my first cohort this week and starting the second one. Um, 
next week. So the third one will, the third cohort will start in April. Um, but I was just so happy uh, because my student who started not knowing anything about multifamily on, or underwriting is now eager to get into deals. And um, she underwrote her first deal from A to Z with very minimal help. Uh, and again, that's someone that was a complete newbie. Um, and over the course of the last um, nine weeks, so I guess next week will be the last class, um, she's really gotten it down. Um, so I'm really, really proud of her. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Any last words, friends? No? Well, thank you everyone for attending. Vessi, thank you again so much. This was very helpful. And I think we all can say that we appreciate your time tonight. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Vessi. Appreciate it. Thank it you. Great. Thanks, Vessi. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to message me directly and find me on social media. I'll put a link to my Calendly as well um, in case you'd like to schedule a call. And uh, happy to help you and add value. Excellent. And happy New Thank Year. you so much. Happy New Year. Yeah. Take Thank care, you. everyone. See you in two weeks. All right.